Hi everybody, and today you find the exiled yellow belly in Dunstable, where I have come to see Dr. Richard Shepherd, the retired Home Office pathologist and author of the book Unnatural Causes, giving a talk at the Grove Theatre this evening. But I thought I'd make a day of it, as I had heard an interesting story about Sally the Dunstable Witch. Now let's go into St. Peter's at Dunstable and explore about more about this story. Now, apparently, Sally lived around 600 years ago in the town, and at first only harmlessly told fortunes. But as she got older, she started to play with bad spirits and acquired a black cat, which taught her the dark arts, which she started to use on her neighbours or anyone who offended her. All sickness in children and cattle, mysterious fires, etc., were blamed on Sally. And eventually the townspeople had had enough and went to the prior calling for Sally to be tried for witchcraft and if found guilty to be burned at the stake. The enterprising prior, though, had first sold them charms to ward off the evil eye. But when Sally counteracted them with more black magic, he was eventually forced to bow to public opinion. And at her trial, she was found guilty of witchcraft and was sentenced to be burned at the stake with her cat and her stick, and then be banished to hell. On the day of the execution, the shops closed early at 3 pm so everyone could go to watch the spectacle. The prior had a special chair placed outside the priory gateway for a grandstand view of the proceedings. On the square, Sally was brought through the crowds and put upon the pyre. As the flames licked around her, suddenly she raised her head, looked at the crowd and waved her stick in the air, uttering a frightening curse, where my ashes sink today, Never any child shall play for the earth that's under me till doomsday shall heated be. And for good measure, she also said she planned to haunt the priory and be a general nuisance to the prior and the monks. And right on cue, when she finished her curse, a storm raged with thunder and lightning and hailstones, which forced everybody to flee for their homes. When later, the men returned to clear the site, they couldn't because the stones, even though soaking wet, remained red hot and no one would dare touch Sally's bones. Back at the church, the prior was cursed in old Sally with holy water and prayers when suddenly the big bell in the steeple began to toll. The monks fell to their knees as they knew no living person was ringing it. When it stopped, Sally's ghost was seen to glide down right up to the prior's side. She then set about him, sending him sprawling and followed up by attacking the monks, singeing the prayer books and letting out a long, loud satanic laugh. For months, Sally played around at the priory and as the stones in the square were still red hot, a fence was erected so children would not play there and get burnt. The story of the curse soon spread far and wide, but nothing and no one could exorcise the spirit until one night in dark December, when the priory gate was locked after nightfall, there came a stranger who knocked gently on the door of the priory. The stranger was a pilgrim palmer returning from the Holy Land complete with scallop, stick, palm leaf and relics who had come to rid the priory of the curse. He was taken to the church and as soon as they had entered, Sally glided down from the rafters. The pilgrim uttered some mystic words which rendered Sally powerless and holding out an empty bottle, he thundered, just jump in there an order she dare not disobey. When she was in the bottle, it was sealed with a cork, 
and the palmer buried it in the churchyard with a warning. But if ere this broken be, out the wicked ghost shall flee, and shall plague you ten times more than she ever did before. Now stones were placed upon the site, and with the spell broken, the area on the square soon cooled down, and a deep well was dug for the witch's bones, and a pump with a fence around it was erected on top. Over the years, the exact burial place of the bottle was forgotten, and as the residents of Dunstable were afraid of disturbing it, the state of the churchyard became a local scandal. Does the churchyard go to ruin? Graves and fences getting worse. Everyone devoutly wishing not to free the bottled curse. So what do you think of that? What a fantastic story. That's right. But unfortunately, it's all made up. And the reason for this is, which is also a very interesting tale, that the people of Dunstable were very distressed about the state of the Priory Churchyard. They pleaded with the Reverend Frederick Hose, the Rector of Dunstable, to clear the weeds and repair the fences, which would then stop the cattle and pigs foraging amongst the gravestones. At this time, the north aisle of the parish church was in ruins, and the Reverend Hose was anxious to have it carefully restored, but it was proving a very costly business. As he never disclosed the church accounts, it was assumed the real reason for his reluctance was insufficient funds. By collecting subscriptions, the church wardens raised enough money for the work to be completed. However, instead of being grateful, the rector was furious and returned it all to them. So the churchyard continued to deteriorate even more. The Reverend Hugh Smith, Rector of Houghton Regis, with the Reverend Holmes were both on the board of trustees at the Ashton Elementary Church Schools. And in 1875, Mr. Alfred E. Wire, a schoolmaster, Mr. Wire soon became acquainted with the problem of the churchyard and wondered how he could assist but was warned that the rector could be very vindictive if anything was done without his consent, a warning that later proved correct. Although the Reverend Hose was very, very clever and a good preacher, he is also described as selfish, unscrupulous and unpopular, so church services were very poorly attended. In the centre of the High Street and in the front of the west end of the church, there was a rusty iron pump with a chained handle surrounded by a rusty iron fence. Underneath the roadway was two large storing tanks that were now obsolete, but originally had been constructed to hold the gallons of surplus rainwater coming from the Chiltern Hills. The location and pump inspired Mr. Wyatt to compose a story about a witch's curse and a possible reason as to why the churchyard was not being repaired. And the result was a poem, which with 81 stanzas, plus all the right ingredients, including a touch of humour, friends were very enthusiastic on reading it, and Mr W.J. Smith of 14 High Street Dunstable offered to print and publish the ballad free of charge. The author stipulated his name went onto the title page, not for credit, but as a precaution against it being attributed to anyone else. Boys being boys, they quickly learnt the poem and took great delight in shouting it out about the streets of Dunstable. The Reverend Hose was not amused. In fact, he was furious, and Mr. Wire had to resign his post but very quickly found a new one. The Reverend Hugh Smith of Houghton Regis sent for him and gave him a £10 note from the trustees to help with his moving expenses, but without the knowledge of the Reverend Hose. Reverend Hose explained that having been a pillar of the community, his pride had been solely wounded 
as the county had condemned his attitude towards the churchyard. After the schoolmaster had left the Reverend House, wrote to the Education Department accusing Mr Wyatt of stealing sundry vases and scientific apparatus belonging to the school. Of course, the allegations were proved false and the missing items were found in Dunstable. The Priory Churchyard was eventually put in order and the corporation removed the rusty pump and fences from the square. So the poem had done its job. But just by coincidence, while researching this story, I came upon another. In the spring of 1667, four Dunstable women were put on trial before judges. Sir Wadham Wyndham, yep, that's really his name, and Sir William Morton. They were accused of witchcraft. The most serious charge being that of bewitching small children to death. The first woman to be brought forward was Elizabeth Pratt who was examined and found to have witches marked upon her body. She, in turn, denied the crime of bewitchment, but stitched up three of her neighbours instead, Mary Paul, the innkeeper's wife, Ursula Clark, the wife of a labourer, and Mary Hudson, the butcher's wife. Elizabeth did, however, admit that the devil had appeared to her in the form of a man, a woman, and a cat, and he had made a contract with her promised her that she would live as well as the best woman in Dunstable. But she'd now found him to be a liar, as she could name 20 witches in the town that wore much better clothes than she. But she would not reveal them all just yet. Me thinks they should have quit while she was ahead. There is no record of a prosecution of the four women, and it would appear that they were acquitted but I doubt if Liz got a pint of beer, a joint of meat, or any building repairs done after the court case. But that wouldn't be for long anyway, because later in the year, Elizabeth had further charges made against her, this time causing the deaths of John and Josias, the sons of Josias Seven Senior, a barber surgeon. Now it's always amazed me that someone trained to give your hair a trim could automatically be the go-to person to have a bit of body sliced off as well. But maybe I'm just too sensitive. Anyway, according to record, she had come to the Settle's house begging for food, and while there she stroked John's head saying that the brothers were her boys. Two days later, John became ill and cried out, Murder! Murder! I am bewitched! This resulted in the neighbours fetching Liz and forcing the dying boy to scratch her with a pin to see if he could make her bleed. It was believed that witches could not bleed if treated in this way, and true to popular belief, it was found that she could not. As a result of this, Elizabeth was locked up in the county jail, but before the trial could take place, she died in prison. Strangely, the two judges died soon after. It is said there is a witch's grave in this graveyard with a peephole in it. Whether it's Elizabeth's or can be found is not known.